share your screen. Um, and as I mentioned, we're keeping the introduction uh, short, but I have to admit that it's a great honor and a pleasure to uh, introduce Professor El Mahadevan from Harvard University to you. And Maha, I'm really uh, excited to hear your trajectory talk. Oops. Okay. You're Thank bad. you. Sorry, was there a question or? Okay, I, I, can I start? I think you can start, yeah. Okay, all right. So thank you so much, Arif. Thanks, uh, Sri. And um, I'm afraid uh, I'm a pale imitation, very pale imitation of what Christina just uh, <laughs> gave you. Um, um, so I have just one slide, but it's in little bits and pieces. And I was told that I should say a little bit about my own history. And so I would start with this equal area map, um, which is uh, a trajectory physically. Um, I, I was born in India uh, and uh, to a family which immensely valued education. My, my mother was and still is a teacher. Uh, she teaches children with disabilities uh, and, and, and in particular children who have uh, Down's syndrome, for those of you who know, for many, many years, she's taught children. My father um, was an engineer, he's retired now in the Indian Air Force, and as a consequence of being in the Air Force, uh, we traveled a lot. So I never stayed in one place for too long. And I think that's, a, in a nutshell, the history of my life as well, uh, either physically or now intellectually. Um, uh, so I was born, as I said, in, 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 in India, in New Delhi, came, went back and forth to a few different cities, uh, from Delhi to Pune, from Pune back to Delhi, then back to Pune, then to Bangalore, then to Chennai. So the first 21 years there, uh, moved to the U.S., um, um, you know, briefly in Austin, Texas. You can't see my arrow, and I'm sorry. Um, then to California, where I got my Ph.D., uh, was a postdoc uh, in Chicago, uh, came to Cambridge, and then it turns out that the, the geodesic from one part of Cambridge to another passes through the other Cambridge. Uh, and so that's what I basically did. I spent a few years there, and then I've been here at Harvard for the last uh, longer than I have not been anywhere. Um, okay, so how's that? All right, so my earliest interests, uh, uh, my father used to get back old radios and, and broken pieces of equipment. Uh, and so I just remember tinkering with them. And I used to imagine that there was some human being or a set of human beings behind. And because I grew up on Air Force bases, uh, I went to sleep and got up to the noise of planes. And so that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a pilot. And I was dissuaded from being that because uh, my parents said um, they had seen too many accidents. Um, and so they were very, very dissuasive of my becoming a pilot. Uh, um, simultaneously, you know, in school, one of my favorite subjects in that order, it was literature, which is geography. I don't know what the geography is taught anymore in schools, but we learned geography um, and history, science and math. Uh, and I don't know why. I, I think I just knew how to add and subtract or something of that sort. Uh, um, and when I went to college, um, I was told you become a doctor or an engineer. There are very safe choices. Um, and so that's what I wrote exams for in India, and I got into a medical school. I also got into an engineering school. It just so happened that the medical school opened a couple of months later. So I was told, uh, go to engineering school. And so that's what I did. Um, um, and I had a sense then that I just wanted to learn. I didn't really know what I wanted to learn. Um, I sort of still feel the same way. I just would like to be a student. And, and a remarkable thing happened for the first time, I think in my life, I saw people around me who actually truly enjoyed learning. Until then, I, you know, I saw people, but I didn't really feel that that was true. And in college, I, I saw that. I saw it in my, my uh, uh, friends. I saw that in some of my teachers, and that was just remarkable. Um, and I got a sense that you could go to graduate school um, and, and actually be a student. So that's what I did with the crowd. Um, and two remarkable things happened. I actually went to uh, University of Texas at Austin and, and after a year, uh, I felt that that was probably not the right thing. Um, I actually went there because I got a fellowship and they paid for my airfare. But then after a year, uh, uh, someone at Stanford said, you can come here. And I said, okay, so maybe that's good because the weather is good. So I, I just went to Stanford and I met two people who changed my life uh, in, in order. Um, my, my, my now wife, uh, Amala, um, if you can't read what it says on the dog, it says every scientist needs a lab. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, 
And I also met a person who changed my life intellectually, a person who changed my life in every way, and a person who changed my life intellectually, Joe Keller, who is this uh, remarkable mathematician, scientist, engineer, physicist, you can call him what you want, and I think he would fit all these uh, bills uh, remarkably well. And, uh, and I, for the first time, in one individual was able to see that um, you could just be curious. That's it. You could just be curious and you could live a life uh, and be paid and have fun and work with interesting people and just think about things and think about new things every day. And it didn't really matter what happened. It didn't really matter whether you succeeded. It didn't really matter uh, whether you solved the problem, but you could just do it. And, and, and I guess to some, uh, uh, not, not to some, to a complete degree, I feel that I in, intellectually, I owe everything to, to him. Um, and I also got the sense then, oh, you could be a student forever. And it almost became a reality. I almost didn't graduate because I sort of could just keep switching from one problem to another and eventually told me, you know, you're at the bottom of the totem pole and if you don't get out, uh, you may never get out. Um, and I somehow, somebody took pity on me. I, I, I got a job uh, uh, at um, the University of Illinois and then I had to finish. I probably wouldn't have finished uh, except for the fact that I, 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 I got a job. Um, um, and then from then, like Christina was saying, it's been a little bit of a random walk for me uh, in terms of fields. Uh, uh, but I realized, uh, thanks to both these people, both to Amala, you know, who personally uh, made me uh, who I am in any good way uh, and is not responsible for any of the bad things, and Joe, who taught me how to think uh, that it's possible to find one's own paths and not worry too much about what other people think, exactly like what Christina was saying. Just keep learning. And surprisingly, as you keep learning and keep repeating what other people do, eventually you find suddenly you are creating things. You didn't even know that you were doing it and it happens. Uh, uh, I think it's an experience that every, probably everybody over here has had. I hope that you continue to have it forever. Uh, just keep repeating things and that's how children learn and I think that's how adults learn. Uh, somehow there's a transition from repetition to creativity. Um, and so I'm somewhere in between these, these, these fields. Um, and if I'm often asked, uh, unfortunately, you know, to pigeonhole myself, I don't know what to say. And so I hope it's okay to say that I'm just a, a wanderer uh, who tries to wander and I prefer this old fashioned uh, label of, you know, just curious about the world uh, in literally every way and it's fine. I was asked to say something about, you know, what one might say to uh, younger people. Um, and here is my little summary. Uh, Lemony Snicket, whose books we used to read when our children were very young. Uh, I think they were called a series of unfortunate events in the life of Lemony Snicket. And for me, it's been a series of fortunate accidents. Uh, I've been remarkably lucky with students and postdocs, including some that I see over here. Um, I've also been surprisingly, perhaps to say this, uh, remarkably lucky in failing frequently and not being chastised for it. Uh, it's okay. You know, one of the wonderful things about science is that you only count the integral and you only actually put an absolute value also. You don't even care about the negatives. Uh, um, so it's self-correcting and if you make mistakes, it's fine. Eventually somebody will fix it and the subject carries on. Um, a defect, at least I used to think it's a defect. I'm now told it's not. I still think it's a defect. It's just to go off on all kinds of paths and get lost all the time. Uh, keep random, be reading, you know, and so, so you know, keep your uh, ears open and your, on your, uh, your mind open, but not so much that it falls down or falls apart. I don't know. My mind's probably fallen apart at this stage. And one of the wonderful things that I have had uh, so much fun with is teaching out of one's comfort zone over the years. Uh, Anytime somebody asks whether you want to teach a new course in the field and nobody volunteers, I'm the idiot who does. And I'm always happy that, um, that I did so because I learned and I sometimes had to learn this a few hours before. And then uh, the other question that I'm often asked is, you know, how does one choose problems or how do you choose problems? And for me, I've been, you know, again, very lucky. I, because I think I didn't really have um, role models until fairly late, uh, in, in, in typical scientist life until I was actually well into graduate school. In fact, I had switched advisors. Uh, um, I didn't feel that there was one way uh, to, 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 
uh, look at problems or one field, whether it's you know mathematics or physics or biology. And so you, it just so happened that, and I was not trained as a laboratory uh, experimental scientist. So what do you do? You just use your eyes, you use your ears, and you and and you just sort of feel your way around. And so this is wonderful. And you know you can apparently do that, and and people are happy with it. And from the point of view of biology, what could be better? because literally it's in front of you at every level. Uh, it's teeming with beautiful questions at all scales. Um, and as I learned from, from, from Joe and from Amala, you know, don't worry about importance ever. Um, and I wanna close with one of my favorite quotes from a very famous scientist. So you don't have to take me uh, or my word, uh, but I'm sure you will take uh, Lev Landau's words. Um, and this was from an essay which Philip Anderson wrote uh, about Landau and it's, uh, from a biography, and I'm going to have to read it. Uh, one must have a rather ridiculous immodesty to regard only the most important problems of science as worthy of one's interest. A physicist, and replace that by scientists, should not embark on her scientific work from considerations of vanity. So please, if I had to say anything you know, to young people, don't worry about whether people say you're working on something important or not. If it excites you, that's enough because it's about you in the first place. If you're happy, everything else will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maha, that was great. Um, let me just switch the view here. Uh, okay, so uh, we have time for some questions. Um, anybody wanna go? So I like asking personal questions. Um, how did you, uh, is Amla also a scientist and yes. how did you meet her? Yeah, she's an oceanographer. Mm -hmm. And we met because both of us were interested in two things which somehow coincided. Um, the first was uh, Sanskrit, and, you know, uh, and, and you know, sure, but for others, it's uh, an ancient uh, Indian or Indo-European language. Um, and so we both wanted to learn uh, Sanskrit and then learn Tamil, um, which is my mother tongue. And, um, and we both wanted to rock climb. And we found simultaneously an individual, a very generous uh, 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 graduate student who was um, giving free classes, including the ability to essentially rent uh, climbing shoes. And then we used to go every weekend. So that's how we met. Um, and, and you asked, she's a scientist? Yeah, so she's an oceanographer. Um, but it's interesting, I haven't seen a single paper of yours on anything to do with ocean currents, oceanography. I could be wrong. You may, Have you written something on it? No. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm learning still from her. All right. Other questions? Um, I have a question. So you said that uh, you like to learn widely. How does one finish a PhD if you are like all over the place? I, I almost did not. I was all over the place. Um, I was told by my advisor multiple times, um, <laughs> you better finish. Uh, and, uh, he, you know, he is no more. Um, uh, he passed away about four years ago or so. And, and, um, and so I was very, I was very intimidated. I mean, he was already, I was one of his last students, perhaps his last student. And, um, he was not intimidating as an individual, but he was intimidating because of the reputation that he had. Uh, um, and um, so when he said that to me, I, I, what am I going to do next? You know, I mean, he's telling me that I'm not doing things because I'm one day telling him about something that I read here and another telling him about something that I read. There. It's always I'm telling him about what I read, not what I've done, because I've not done anything. <laughs> um, uh, and eventually, uh, I don't know, I mean, yeah, there was a, some accident and, and I managed to do something which apparently was sufficient. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be coy. I mean, <laughs> this it was literally was what it was. Um, does that answer anything? <laughs> Maybe. I'll find out. All right. You know, the tree is patiently waiting to ask a question. Yeah, Maha, I had a question for you, but having heard your uh, presentation, I'm wondering about the wisdom of asking it, but let me go ahead and ask it, ask it anyway. Um, so, so, so you did make this point so clearly about intrinsic versus extrinsic value of stuff. 
So forgive me for asking about the Ig Nobel Prize. Um, I am asking on behalf of all the early career people who want to grow up and <laughs> walk up the stairs of Sanders Theater and win their own Ig Nobel Prizes. Um, what, besides having a sense of wonder and playfulness and curiosity, can they do to maximize their chances? Oh, well, I mean, I, I'm sure you'd expect my answer. You should never work for something. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> um, I have to say what happened, though, uh, even though it's on, on tape, I will say it. Uh, you know, when um, Mark Abrams uh, called me up and said, I wanted to tell you something, would you be OK with it? Uh, and, um, and I said, sure. And then he said, you know, we would like to give you the Nobel Prize. But he said, is it OK? And the reason he said that, he told me, was because there are people who get very upset by it. In fact, there is a very famous biologist, actually an applied mathematician who used to be at Harvard, uh, who just passed away a year ago, Robert May, who used to be, among other things, uh, president of the Royal Society. And he explicitly wrote an article telling um, whoever the organizers are not to give it to British scientists because it's making fun of their work. All right. Um, so that's perhaps taking oneself too seriously. And um, one of the things that I think one has to, you know, be as a scientist is uh, not take oneself too seriously. Uh, I would say as an individual, not just as a scientist. Uh, um, so, so when he asked me that, I, I think he asked me that from this perspective. And I said, sure, what's the big deal? And, um, and I got a lot of congratulatory messages from colleagues, mostly friends, actually, but nobody from Harvard said anything. <laughs> wow. I think they were feeling sorry, <laughs> sad. I don't know. I asked someone later on and said, I was not sure that you should congratulate someone on getting the Nobel because the United States Air Force got it for creating stink bombs and somebody got it for figuring out, uh, you know, I, I think the wombat uh, actually poos in the shape of cuboids or some such thing. Um, I am proud of something. Uh, I got it before Joe Keller did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he got it a few years later for figuring out the frequency at which ponytails swing. And he connected it to a wonderful equation in mathematical physics called the Matthew equation. And then one of my students got it, David Hu. Fantastic. <laughs> so, so that's kind of cool. To be ignoble multiple times is kind of cool. <laughs> it makes you humble. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you so much. All right, uh, I think we should probably move on to the last uh, uh, session. With